For this month's fashion roundup, we're talking about Kylie Jenner's new collection, an AI chatbot that's making fast fashion even worse, rumors that one of fashion's most loved brands is a terrible place to work, and Emily in Paris's dip into the rental market, plus a whole load more. There's a lot to cover, so let's get into it. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. If you are new here, hi, my name's Katie. I talk about sustainable fashion headlines and industry analysis. So if that sounds good to you, subscribe to my channel, follow me on my socials and let's get into the video. Kylie Jenner is dipping her toes back into swimwear with Kai's latest collection. Drop 10 of Kai is rumored to be swimwear. Kylie Jenner's teased it on her Instagram story and people are already disappointed with it. You may have seen that recently Kai came out with their drop eight, which also included swimwear, which one newspaper highlighted was Kai's first swimwear line, but it's definitely not Kylie's. Kylie Swim was Kylie Jenner's first foray into swimwear, launched back in 2021, I think, and it was slammed for a lot of reasons online. Poor quality clothing, exposed seams, little to no coverage of the swimsuit, and just generally a bad product. Let's hope that she's worked on this for her new swimwear collections. Although judging by the response to Drop 8 online, people still have issues issues with the product. Just like Kylie Swim, they're pointing out exposed seams and just generally shoddy workmanship. And also some people are just straight up saying that this doesn't feel like swimwear to them. One creator who was gifted the Kai corset swim top said that she wouldn't be wearing it to swim, but she'd wear it out. I've criticized Kylie Jenner's brand before as not really making that much sense, not having a lot of thought into it and just feeling like a way for the celebrity to get money out of people that follow her. And in general, I've criticized celebrity brands for the exact same thing, for creating products that we don't need and that don't take sustainability into account. And I'm just confused as to why influencers are allowed to keep getting away with this. Kai has no sustainability messaging to speak of, like literally you can search on their site for sustainability and no results come back. It's just like sustainability isn't even on their radar, which in 2024 is insane. Now we're staying in the US for this next story because fashion might be coming to the White House. President Joe Biden is being urged to include representatives of the US fashion and textiles industry in his recently announced task force on climate and trade. Two groups representing politicians in US Congress and lobby groups have written to the president to tell them why they think fashion should be involved in this task force. They believe that addressing America's fashion industry is crucial for overall progress towards sustainability, stating in the letter that it's a multinational industry valued at just under $10 trillion in the US. And the fact that Americans are the biggest consumers of fashion in the whole world, coupled with the millions of people employed by the industry domestically, should give them a seat at this table. And to be fair, they're definitely right. As they point out in the letter, the US is lagging behind other countries when it comes to progress towards fashion sustainability. Still, it's uncertain whether the administration will allow it, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Now, I actually covered this next story on Twitter and on my TikTok, so you might have already seen it, but I wanted to mention it here too, since it's such a big thing. If you didn't see my initial coverage, here's the gist. ASOS is now allowing customers to haggle with a robot online in order to bring the prices of their already criminally cheap fashion down. Now, this is not AI built by ASOS. It's actually built by a third party company called Nibble, who are trying to advocate for more fashion companies using this service. Real quick, let's go over the most pressing ways that this is a bad idea. And I'm gonna link my TikTok and my Twitter thread so you can dive into this issue deeper if you want to. One is that the robot is not actually giving you a really good deal. This 15 pound dress has already been priced to include the haggling process you go through with the robot. So although you might think you're getting a few pounds off the purchase, really brands are willing to let it go for probably even less than you get to. Two is that the robot creates a false sense of urgency, which is a dark marketing tactic that brands should not be using. The robot saying that this dress is in limited supply, it's just a blanket statement to get you to think that you need to buy the purchase quicker in order to get your hands on it. It's also putting the idea in consumers' minds that brands are marking prices up and and they could probably be pricing them lower, which is a very dangerous mindset to have when you're shopping on these fast fashion websites where they're not paying their garment workers right. Basically, I worry for a future where a lot of brands have this AI product 
in place. The next story is about one of fashion's biggest supplier hubs and how its recent political turmoil is impacting the fashion industry. Now, I'm by no means an expert about what's happening in Bangladesh, but I do know that it's the world's second largest garment exporter after China. If you've been following the situation, you'll know that in the past couple weeks, there's been temporary curfews and brief closures of many factories, including fashion manufacturers. But now those apparel factories have resumed production and new leaders have been appointed. There's been a lot of worry from suppliers based in Bangladesh as to how fashion is going to react to this political unrest, whether they'll be pulling their orders or demanding discounts. There's been a little bit of disagreement as to how fashion actually has reacted. Some experts in the country have been saying that brands have been standing with them, despite the fact that the opposite was reported in the Financial Times. But other experts have said that some indicators are signaling significant declines in new orders, exports, and supplier deliveries. It was reported that the apparel industry was losing up to $150 million a day at the height of curfews when a lot of the factories were closed temporarily. And it was also reported that a lot of garment workers didn't receive their monthly wages for July. There's since been a statement saying that those payments are coming soon and it was due to banks being closed during the curfews. Obviously, this is a tense situation, but you have to think about the garment workers over there who might be facing job insecurity if fashion pulls out and also might be suffering under the fact that they haven't received this month's wages when a lot of them are living hand to mouth. We'll definitely need to keep an eye on how fashion reacts to this long term. The last thing we want is for brands to be cancelling their contracts with Bangladesh suppliers and causing further instability. Already, Indian textile markets have been betting that they stand to gain on this situation. Okay, from a whole country in turmoil to a very beloved fashion house. Phoebe Philo is being dragged online for a toxic work culture. The first I heard about the situation was a tweet from fashion influencer Brenda Hashtag, who said that people who are interested should be looking at Phoebe Philo's glass door reviews. Those reviews show that Phoebe Philo's workplace culture is toxic, with many employees pointing out that they had to stay ridiculously long hours, not be paid for overtime, and have Phoebe shout at them, all whilst trying to sell $5,000 dresses. Now, if you don't know any anything about Philo's brand. It's a independent fashion house, which is partly owned by LVMH. They have a minority stake of 49%, but Phoebe is the one running it and calling the shots, apparently. The brand was met with a lot of love when it was launched nine months ago. Phoebe was an industry darling when she was at Celine, and when she launched this eponymous collection, people were very interested. Things were selling out almost immediately. One fashion writer I follow said that when she was online looking through the new collection, it was almost like being on the Shein homepage. She felt that if she didn't buy something quickly, she wouldn't be able to get her hands on it. One of her posts dived into the sustainability of Phoebe Philo's brand and pointed out that this limited availability, lots of urgency business model is by design to increase sustainability, which in itself is quite a sustainable thing. I mean, making sure that everything you create is purchased is sustainable. But then Tiffany goes into the lack of transparency within the rest of the brand, pointing out that although there was quite a lot of natural fibers, for instance, there was no real information about those fabrics, about where they came from, about the supply chain or the certifications used. It will be interesting to see how the brand takes on this controversy and maybe tries to address it or maybe just thinks that the people who are buying it don't care, especially considering she's an independent designer and LVMH are not technically on the hook for anything she does because of how this was structured. Moving on, you probably know it was Copenhagen Fashion Week recently and I'd love to know what your guys' favorite looks from there was. I think mine personally were the dandelion pants we saw at Rolf Eckroth, but one thing I think we need to talk about with the big four fashion weeks coming up in September is the way that Copenhagen is still the only big fashion week to address sustainability at an impactful scale. How long do we think it's gonna take for London, Milan, Paris, and New York to put in similar requirements that Copenhagen have put in place for years now? And also how long do we think it will be until all of the fashion weeks address one of the biggest polluters in the industry, which is the air travel of all those buyers, models, journalists, etc etc 
traveling around the globe every few months. I don't know, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this. Okay, next is an update to the Dior situation that we covered in last month's fashion headline video. If you'll remember, there was an Italian court that was looking into Dior's unfair labor practices back in July and a further investigation probing whether they had misled customers over their commitment to social responsibility and craftsmanship. Well, they're back in the press, but this time because of their UK activity. Until last month, they were behind on the disclosures required by UK law about working conditions in their supply chain. In Britain, the Modern Slavery Act requires companies with a certain turnover to publish annual statements detailing the steps they're taking to stop forced labor in their supply chains. Until July 19th, Dior was showing an anti-slavery statement on their website that was four years out of date and it only got addressed when Reuters pointed it out. According to Reuters, they sent a request to Dior on July 18th asking them about the outdated statement and their compliance with UK regulation. Dior published a 2023 Modern Slavery Act statement which said it was approved by the Dior board on July 18th which is very very interesting. There's been a lot of requests from LVMH's investors to step up compliance and reporting within the company so I guess we'll have to keep an eye out for whether this kind of stuff keeps happening or whether LVMH start taking it seriously. Next story is also an update on one I covered in last month's headlines and it's about Nike. So if you remember we talked about the sustainability bloodbath of the company laying off hundreds of their sustainability staff and how it pointed out that the company was prioritizing short-term growth over long-term sustainability efforts. And also we talked about the context that the company had not been doing well recently. Well, funny enough, just recently I was browsing a sustainability job board and I saw that Nike was hiring for a senior director in sustainable product design. This is weeks after that backlash and where they publicly said that they will be making everybody's role in the company sustainability focused. So there was no need to have sustainability in anyone's job title. And funny enough, this coincides with their shares surging by 17% over nine days, which is the first bit of upwards growth they've seen in a while. And obviously it's not a direct parallel. I'm not drawing direct conclusions, but it is a big coincidence that as soon as they're seeing short-term growth, they're hiring back for sustainability roles. Okay, onto the good news section now, which I like to do at the end of these videos to point out the good things happening in sustainability. And for the first story, we're gonna be talking about Emily in Paris going circular. In the new season of the Netflix show, the resale platform Vestair Collective makes a cameo. And I don't wanna spoil it for anyone because the season's just come out, but Mindy, a character who's best friends with the star of the show, sells a couture dress on the platform in order to make some money. And apparently the whole scene shows Vestair Collective in a very positive light, highlighting not only how easy and how useful it is to have someone on hand to value your garments quickly and give you an estimated cost, but also how those costs can be even more than what's estimated and can give you a lot of cash quickly. Now, obviously this is product placement, but what's really interesting is the fact that Netflix were the ones who approached Vestiaire Collective and they made the whole collaboration a plot point of the show rather than just a quick cameo. Vestiaire Collective on their part are hoping that it will boost US sales, which is a market they've been trying to break into recently. I think it's interesting to look at whether this kind of marketing works and what it kind of signifies in the wider cultural context. I think it shows that resale is becoming a lot more normalized and not only normalized but glamorized considering Emily in Paris is a very high glamour show and it's featured a lot of luxury brands before now but more than that from Vestair Collective's point of view it's a way to show customers that they can still get their luxury fix without the price tag which is particularly timely given that a lot of luxury sales have recently slowed down and people aren't spending as much but even more than that it's showing luxury shoppers that their own collection could be worth a lot of money if they choose to sell it. This Emily in Paris placement fits into a wider campaign called Parlez-vous Vesta, which includes the removal of seller fees on the platform, a series of closet sales by notable celebrities and influencers, and offering first-time listers $50 in credit that they can spend elsewhere on the platform. They're really trying for this luxury push, luxury consumer, and it'll be interesting to see whether it pays off. For the next story, we're talking about rental. By rotation, which is a peer-to-peer 
peer-to-peer -peer rental service and Airbnb have collaborated to offer free wedding guest outfit rentals. The collaboration is definitely an interesting one. It's offering UK customers staying in popular wedding destinations like the UK, but also Greece, LA, France, Spain, the chance to get a complimentary outfit for the duration of that wedding. Given that many people often want to wear something unique to a wedding, just like any other fancy event where they know they'll be getting a lot of pictures and most likely want to post them to Instagram, because of course, outfit repeating is still a hot debate in 2024. Increasing the accessibility of rentals is going to be a good thing towards reducing the environmental impact of clothing. However, Airbnb is not the most ethical company. And although I've included it in the good news section, because this idea of a collaboration between a company that deals in a lot of travel for events and a company that supplies the outfits for those events is very cool. We could have seen this done with a more ethical partner on Buy Your Rotations part. But one thing in Airbnb's favor is that if you were going to do this collaboration with say a luxury hotel chain, then you might not get as much accessibility from lower price point customers. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this, whether you think it's a good collaboration or not. And for the final story, we're going over to South Africa. The country has just announced they're going to tax online fast fashion imports. Very similar to France's fast fashion bill that has been in the works recently and I've spoken about already on this channel. Starting from September 1st, the South African government will add a higher import tax. It's been met with a lot of mixed reviews, specifically from customers. Depending on the value and the weight of the items. If it's under 500 Rand, you're gonna get hit with that 45% plus VAT. If it's over 500 Rand, which is what I recommend, just push your order up a little bit, then you are going to get taxed as it was in the past. But on local businesses part, they're celebrating the fact that it will help them compete with the fast fashion giants. Like I said, it's very similar to a law that France has in the works. And I wonder if it's signifying a global trend towards countries penalizing fast fashion brands. I'd like to see how fast fashion is going to react to this. Like I've already reported on this channel, Shein has recently hiked up their prices, partly due to that impending IPO, which I covered in a whole video, but also partly due to this increase in taxes and legislation they're seeing across the globe. For my part, I think it's a shame that governments are going after fast fashion brands purely for the import tax and framing it like that for the media. I think it'd be very beneficial if their marketing included the environmental impact of these companies, if only to increase public awareness and take a stand on their unethical business models. Okay, if you've watched this far, you're caught up with this month's fashion headlines. I'd love to know your thoughts on any of the stories I've done or anything I might have missed out on. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Have a lovely day and I'll speak to you really soon. Bye.